I've been meaning to make this video for a long while, but unfortunately I've been busy with other things. And now that I'm free, I finally get to make a video response to Stick Sex and Hammer 666. I think there is a major overlap between my subscribers and his channel, so there's no need for an introduction. You guys know who he is. And uh, I'm afraid to disappoint you, it's not going to be YouTube drama. I'm not attacking him as a person, I'm just trying to tackle his arguments and using the video that he made as a uh, jumping spring to other more interesting topics. You see, he made a video saying that um, censorship is un-American, and he is actually talking about cancel culture. And my point as a Eastern European, as a person looking at America from outside and having a completely different point of view than Styx does, I can make the argument that cancel culture is almost inherently American. And cancel culture cannot happen in other nations because they did not have the same requirements that the United States had in order for this culture to take root. You see, while the United States was indeed founded by some of the world's best politicians and uh, some of the world's uh, most amazing philosophers, at the end of the day, the people within America were Christians. And they weren't just any type of Christians, they were Puritans. Um, so America right now is a post-Puritanical society. Because you, you have the mindset of the Puritan that religion is not just something for himself. No, religion is something for the community. Every single person in the community needs to lead by the same set of values and moralities that the Puritan lives. However, because of the Constitution of the United States, which doesn't allow the government to censor and doesn't allow the government to crack on certain individuals' rights, you have a minority of Puritans that try to find a way to punish people outside of the court system, to make sure that their morals are going to be listened to, even if they're not coded into legislation. And these people, these radicals, were always a small fringe group. They could never be the majority. Because if they were ever the majority, then they could just pass their morality into legislation. They could simply just change the constitution if they had the overwhelming numbers to do so. But they never did. So this is why um, in other states, like for example, under the Iron Curtain, censorship could be passed into law. And you could just have uh, the government punishing people. Um, so there was no need for cancel culture. The idea of cancel culture doesn't even exist in the mind of Eastern Europeans. However, in the United States, because you have these groups of people that legitimately wanted to impose their morality upon others, then you have cancel culture. So it's important to define what cancel culture is because a lot of people when go like, especially from the left, they're like, oh, what, what is it? You know, like, is it just uh, being punished for your opinions? No, that's being called held accountable, right? So there is no cancel culture. Uh, cancel culture is the persecution of people outside of the judicial area. And the persecution happens by a fringe group of extremists uh, with the sole purpose to directly harm, hurt, and remove that person from public life. In the past, cancel culture was extremely violent. So we're talking about witch trials, witch burnings, uh, lynching. Uh, but in the present, uh, it's it's a lot more civilized. You only try to get the person to be unemployable, make the person unable to uh, obtain sustenance for himself, his family, so that he ends in the street, preferably. Um, there is no need to go the extra mile and do these violent, gruesome acts because most people do get the message when they see someone getting fired for an opinion, they're just going to zip their mouth. Now, I want to point out that uh, in Eastern Europe, the mentality, like the idea of uh, someone getting fired for their opinions is ludicrous. Like here, we believe that when a person is at work and he's on the timetable, he does get to represent the company and the boss does have influence over what the person thinks and behaves while at the workplace. So for example, if you go at a McDonald's, the cashier is required to smile. Now, the smiling isn't something that the person necessarily wants to do. You know, he probably saw a thousand people that day. He doesn't feel the need to smile for the a thousand one person. However, he is required to do so by contract. He wants to work at McDonald's. He is told to smile at the customer. 
And because of that, if he wants to get paid, he has to do it. However, when the person is not on company grounds, when he is not on the premise of the company, society at large doesn't view him as a representative of the company. So his actions do not reflect on McDonald's when he is at home or when he is in his free time. That is a culture that doesn't have the idea of cancellation, of persecuting people for their beliefs. But in the United States, you definitely do have that culture. It is ingrained in the public image that whatever a person says or does even outside of working hours is a representative of the company that he works at and furthermore is being endorsed by the company to behave in such a way. So if, let's say, a person goes out on the street and grabs a reporter's microphone and says, grab her by the pussy, it is considered that the company endorses that behavior as long as they keep that guy employed. And that is an American way of thinking, at least modern-day American way of thinking. Um, and, and in order for cancel culture to exist, this way of thinking was cemented by the mainstream media into the mind of the public, that corporations aren't just the businesses anymore, but they're like communities which send people and endorses people to behave in a certain way. Um, it's kind of funny because it's only with negative behavior, right? Like if you have a guy working at McDonald's and he saves a kid from drowning, it's not considered that McDonald's endorsed or, or McDonald's should be congratulated for having the employee of the month. However, if the person does grab the microphone from a reporter and says the horrible incantation, then it's McDonald's responsibility to fire that person or the taint of uh, sexismus is going to be uh, upon the fast food restaurant, right? So um, that's one thing that I wanted to say, like what, what is the, the, the culture? Now, for an American to understand how bizarre this is for an Eastern European, um, imagine you're reading a book about a medieval tale. And let's say a guy goes to a bar and he, he goes into an argument. Uh, he's, he goes into a fist fight and he trashes the place. Right? Now, the normal way of thinking is like, okay, well, the person is going to be put in the dungeon to cool off and you know he's going to be punished by the local lord. Imagine that instead you, you, you find the story that uh, the people at the bar, instead of going to the authorities... What they do is they go to the local blacksmith where the guy has an apprenticeship at and tries to convince the blacksmith to break the apprenticeship of the person that acted disrespectfully in the bar. It wouldn't make sense from a, from a story point if you write something like that. It would be crazy, right? I mean, um, you wouldn't even think about it until the author would send you that route. But that, that is how we Europeans view what Americans are doing right now. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's uh, seeping over to Europe as well, but it's not because uh, of people being persuaded. It's just because of the technology that exists nowadays that unites the world together. Technology such as the internet, television, Netflix, and so on and so forth, which uh, are making Europeans also being um, more open-minded to, to this way of thinking, that you can get a lot of power in society uh, if you start bullying corporations and companies and uh, getting people fired who disagree with you. Now, here's the interesting part, okay? This is why I said that America always had this. And I'm not talking about, you know, the witch trials and the other persecutions. No, 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 no. I'm talking about the fact that before, there used to be conservatives that did the exact same thing. Uh, a lot of people who are born more recently probably never knew about this, especially people who were born in the 90s probably have no idea. But uh, look up uh, conservative groups such as the moral majority. The moral majority were conservative groups that weren't moral and they weren't a majority either. Uh, but they engaged in these exact same type of tactics. Uh, another uh, more prominent group, which I believe even exists today, is the One Million Moms. Now, these conservative groups try to enforce a Christian morality upon the public. Um, and uh, they were mostly focused on removing anything that has to do with LGBT from television, uh, anything that they considered to be anti-Christian, uh, but as well as uh, things that were considered to be vulgar. And most people that are right-wingers, they would say, well, what's wrong with that? You know, uh, why is that a bad thing? Well, they went even to ridiculous lengths, just like social justice activists go to ridiculous lengths. Uh, for example, One Million Moms, 
um, had a massive email campaign uh, towards Burger King because one of their commercial was deemed offensive. Uh, you see, they used the D word in the commercial, so it, it was vulgarity. But what what is the D word? Like, did they say dick, uh, double penetration? Uh, no, they said in the commercial, damn, that's a good sandwich. And because they used the word damn, that was considered to be haram. And they started the email campaign and the protests in order to try to get the commercial taken off the air. Now, th there are many examples that I could go through where these Christian groups would freak out, whether a company maybe put a person in a position of power that was uh, uh, from an LGBT community, uh, or maybe they would have like uh, some sort of uh, vulgar message or... Um, th these pressure groups existed even against uh, Dungeons and Dragons and Harry Potter and video games and, and a lot of things, right? So the energy was there. The same type of thing, the, the piety warriors, as they were called, were there. And these um, organizations, these powerful NGOs that had um, strong backings usually, um, just by their existence, empowered other people to bully universities and companies uh, to their whim. The idea of concerned citizen letter doesn't exist here in Eastern Europe. We do not have the culture of the concerned citizen letter. The concerned citizen letter would be when a person didn't like reading something in the news or didn't like a commercial or a cartoon, and then they would write a concerned citizen letter to the university or to the company that released the product, and the company would usually be scared because they would understand that if they don't address it, especially if it was something coming from a renowned activist, then they would be at risk in getting uh, the entire uh, pressure group, the uh, moral majority or one million moms off their ass. If you want to know more about it, like go play the game Postal. I believe Postal 2 mocks this exact particular way of thinking. Uh, they, they, they mock the concerned parents against violent video games or uh, the activists that are like against chopping trees and whatnot or the extra religious people, just not, not religious people, but like crazy religious, like extremely so, um, the fanaticals ones, right? So uh, they, they always exist. I think what Sticks Hexenhammer notices and, and what he accurately points out is that they're a little bit more effective now than they used to be. And it's mostly to do with technology, the fact that most people can do this activism from home. In the past, if you wanted to write a concerned citizen mail, well, you had to go to the post, you had to buy a stamp, um, you had to write the mail by hand and then go out and uh, file it. Um, and you didn't get the dopamine, you didn't get the pleasure uh, of letting other people know just how pious you are. Uh, nowadays, people do it on social media and everyone gets to see it, how you're calling out the big company and how you're trying to ruin someone else's life. And if the person gets fired, everyone congratulates you and it's like, yes, job well done, you improve society. So it's a bigger dopamine rush. It appeals to more people uh, and it's a lot easier to do. And because of this, these people are more effective. And because they are more effective, just like the one million moms looking for like any reason, because for these people, it's dopamine to protest, you end up with Dr. Seuss getting canceled, J.K. Rowling being persecuted, so on and so forth. Um, but it's important to point out that I, I know like the same people who used to be piety warriors in the past are the same people that are being uh, into cancel culture now. Like a perfect example is that famous lady from television. The, like uh, the, there used to be that reality show where they would exchange mothers. And the woman was a just a Christian fanatical, right? She goes on and they're like, they are not Christian. She's not a Christian. No! She's tampering in doubt, sad and stuff. So... Now it turns out that this woman is pro-LGBT and she joins gay rallies and whatnot. And this happened in my country as well. Like during communism, we had university professors that uh, would rat on their students and, and they would enforce dogma and ideology. And after the communism fell, all of a sudden they're for free markets and uh, they just had a change of heart and a change of ideology overnight. And it happened before the regime came. Like you used to have libertarian authors and 
um, Romanian writers that were renowned for their work, uh, you know, talking about Christianity and libertarianism. Communism comes, all of a sudden they're pro-atheist and uh, they, they, they're they for the socialist uh, uh, multilateral society. And yeah, uh, The reason is that these people, they realize that um, they can't achieve power by themselves, right? Like they, they're never going to end up climbing the ranks at a company and then wielding power because of their talent and merit. So what they do is by joining these um, moral mobs, by, by joining these crusaders, um, by, aligning the, by, by aligning themselves with the powers that be, they gain more powers than they would normally not have. And it makes their dick go big, you know, because at the end of the day, it doesn't enrich their life. But knowing that you on Twitter have managed to bully a multi-million dollar corporation into firing a guy or changing something or, uh, you know, pulling a product from the shelves or, uh, you know, banning a Dr. Seuss book, that makes you get like a little bit of a big dick. Even though like you technically don't have any power, even though like you technically don't improve your life, you, you can't use that power in order to uplift yourself or create something for yourself. You can use that power to destroy others. And then other people fear you. You, you create an aura of fear. You create an aura of dread. Um, especially like what well, I like to see now a lot of uh, journalists doing this to Substack. They're like, oh, I'm, I'm, a, I, I'm worried about my safety. I, I feel so afraid. Oh, I feel so afraid. And all of a sudden, the person that they're afraid of gets uh, canceled. They, they get um, you know, pushed out from the company they're under. It's like, oh, you, you, oh, this Jeremy fellow, oh, this Jeremy fellow criticized my article. Oh, I'm afraid for my safety. Cause, uh, and, and then, you know, like you see Jeremy getting demonetized. Yeah, I mean, th this is the reason that these people do it. And uh, this is why I think America uh, had them. It's because of the way the American society is functioned, right? Like these people cannot change the laws, cannot influence so that the government censors. So they had to find another way, they, and they had years to perfect it, um, to the point where, well, now you don't need the government to punish people. Like, I mean, you, you can't send someone to jail or, or imprison them, but you can make sure that they get homeless and no one wants to, to help them out because they're toxic. So, yeah, that's, that's why I think censorship um, uh, in America is uh, very interesting and quite different than it is in the rest of the world, but it exists nonetheless. I think it's very American. Uh, and um, I, I don't think there's going to be an end to it. Like, I, I don't see it. I'm, the only thing that can happen is for the ideology to change again. And, and maybe they're going to censor from a different aspect or from a different point of view. Uh, but I don't think you're ever going to have like a 100%, you know, non-censorship country uh, in the United States. And also, like, uh, j just to mention this as a by the way, I believe it was during World War I, um, Woodrow Wilson, I believe, was the president. Uh, it's when he banned criticism of the government. Like, you weren't allowed to criticize the war, and you weren't allowed to criticize the government. And that's when the expression crying fire in a crowded theater came up. So this is an honorable mention because, yes, I mean, it can happen that the actual establishment can actively suppress human rights and then just like say, no, you're not allowed to criticize now. The government is going to enforce it. And there was even a time in, uh, maybe I should make another video about this, but there was like a person who got in prison for uh, speaking against the government uh, and he ran for president while he was in prison. It's a very interesting thing. But a lot of people don't uh, don't know these, and, and it's fascinating, you know. It's like this is where the expression "crying uh, fire in a crowded theater" came from, uh, and the reality that there was a fire. <laughs> American people were dying in a war overseas, so yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. But hey, you know, let me know what you think, and I'll see you guys in the comment sections. Take care.